Well, Mark's lesson this morning is Christ and the Pharisees. If that doesn't get your interest, nothing will. So. <laughs> well, we're always trying to get something to get your interest. That's, that's for sure. You, I always listen to Warren's prayers. He was especially grateful for the parables, so I've arranged to teach a passage out of Luke that doesn't have a parable <laughs> in a series of parables. But we are in Luke 16. And we want to continue our study by reading verses 14 through 18 of uh, the chapter. Uh, there are five short, uh, but I think you'll agree with me, very condensed verses that serve as a break from that series of parables that Jesus told and Luke has recorded. He's going to return to the parable uh, method uh, after this, beginning in verse 19 and to the end of the chapter with the parable of the rich man and uh, Lazarus, one of our favorites, I'm sure, so we'll look forward to that. But the verses we will read today are preceded, you'll recall, uh, by the parable of the prodigal son and uh, the parable of the unrighteous steward, uh, both of which had sharp application to the proud Pharisees who uh, I believe were happily circling Jesus and his disciples like wolves around their prey. Uh, the parable of the unrighteous steward, which we studied last time, uh, while directly aimed at Jesus' disciples, according to the first verse of chapter 16, did not, however, uh, miss the Pharisees' ears, as we now learn from verse 14. Now, the Pharisees who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. That's not something uh, we want to be uh, characterized as detestable in the sight of God. At least uh, I don't. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. That last verse uh, is in there, and I'll try to explain the connection, uh, why Jesus turned to that verse uh, in the context uh, that preceded it, but uh, it deserves uh, an entire lesson, and we're not going to be able to, to do that, to talk about uh, divorce and the biblical views on divorce and remarriage. We're going to touch on it, but won't spend as much time, perhaps, as you would like. Uh, well, the Pharisees were not dense. Uh, when Jesus often uh, spoke, a bit, uh, while Jesus often spoke against them, they correctly perceived when they were his targets. And his closing challenge to the crowd in verse 13 of the chapter about the impossibility of serving both God and mammon, which was the term for the world's wealth, they recognized as likely directed more against them than anyone else. Did the Pharisees, uh, did their class in Jesus' day attempt uh, to serve both God and worldly wealth. Well, they certainly claimed to serve God, didn't they? Uh, that was their claim to fame, we might say. They wore their allegiance to the God of the scriptures as a badge of honor and as the distinction upon which their superiority to the lower uh, uneducated classes was founded. But service to God requires that we dismiss our allegiance to other uh, competing objects of devotion. 
uh, that, as is the case with many professing Christians today, they were not willing to do, uh, nor were they willing to admit it. And consequently, they resorted to subtle ways of giving the appearance of devotion to God while circumventing God's laws, demands, and restrictions upon them. Now, we're familiar with many of those from our study of the Gospels, the, the various and devious ways they would twist the implications of the law in order to evade the law's inconveniences to them, and we will see one expressed uh, plainly in our passage here. But the result was that their service to God was severely diluted by competing interests, which often concern conserving wealth for their own purposes. It's a dilemma uh, that confronts most of us who have even a modicum of desire to be a servant of God. There are just so many competing interests set before us in this world, and most of them placed there by the Lord himself to test our devotion to him. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, Romans 12, after three uh, glorious recitations in Romans chapter 9, in chapter 10, and chapter 11 of all that God has done for those he has sovereignly elected, both Gentiles and those of Israel, suddenly, uh, gives the obvious response incumbent upon them. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And he goes on to say, don't be conformed to this world. He, he wrote that because he knew it was our great challenge. It was our great challenge uh, 2,000 years ago at the church uh, in um, uh, uh, Rome. It's our great challenge today uh, in Dallas. And Jesus had observed it uh, over and over again. Uh, Paul had observed it over and over again. And this was the Pharisees' problem. Uh, they did not really understand what it meant to serve God. Instead of acting as uh, his shepherds, which they were intended to be, they had become the worst examples of worldly self-gratification, eschewing tr true service to God, which would mean sacrificing their own selfish desires in order to give succor and support to the sheep they ruled over for the fervent pursuit of preserving their privileged status. They truly were attempting to serve both God and mammon with the result uh, just as Jesus claimed, they were unable to. Jesus had touched a nerve, as is often the case when men are elevated within a society, uh, like politicians, for example. Uh, their high positions within the social hierarchy led to financial benefits as well, commensurate with their social status. It was the opposite with these from what we see later in our New Testaments in the example of the Apostle Paul, who made it his fierce determination not to enrich himself by means of the esteem that the churches rightly held him in because of the labor of love that they witnessed in him. He held a job for the longest time. I bet a lot of you have held jobs. He held a job. Uh, going about this service of ministry he was involved in and so devoted to. He held a job so that he could avoid the appearance even of financial self-interest. He wrote to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 5 how he had never come to them with a pretext for greed. You know, I think we can say about our church not trying to pat ourselves on the back, but we, we don't see leaders in our church who are in it for greed, but turn on the television and you see uh, so-called preachers of the gospel who are in it uh, for that very purpose. So as the Pharisees listened to Jesus, they felt that dread sense of guilt uh, 
uh, arise within them. And, and guilt breeds the kind of scoffing with which they responded in verse 14. They needed to retrieve their image. You know what that feels like. Uh, and reestablish it. And, and ridicule is one of the age-old methods of accomplishing it. They felt that familiar desire of wanting to be back on the top again. Um, so they moved from the defensive posture Jesus had put them in to offense. That's what we say in sports. It's football season. The, the, the best defense is a good offense. Well, the ridicule was their defense mechanism meant to justify themselves, uh, to make them uh, look different than they really were. Uh, behind their scoffing was the deception of self-righteousness. But Jesus saw right through it and called them out in verse 15. He said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is de detestable in the sight of God. Here's a very sad and disturbing uh, thought. Uh, the image we project of ourselves is not always the true one. It's possible for a person to have two or three or more portraits of themselves they attempt to foist upon others depending on which audience it is. The Pharisees were guilty of path passing themselves off before others as something they were not. They had an exalted reputation to guard and as Jesus says it was in the sight of men that was the reputation in the sight of men that they were concerned with. What they wanted to project is what almost every man and woman uh, wishes to project, that they're good people, that, that they're righteous in some sense. And that's what the Lord was accusing them of when he said they were justifying themselves. It was a self-declaration of righteousness they were engaged in, but it was in reality something like a legal fiction uh, behind the external uh, veneer they maintained. We could call it a mask, was corruption and self-glory. You're familiar with the charade known as a Potemkin village. It's a phrase meant to communicate a construction, typically a figurative construction, uh, the purpose of which is to provide an external uh, facade to a situation to make people believe that a situation is better than it actually is. Uh, Grigory Potemkin was an 18th century Russian governor uh, who had a failed relationship with the uh, Roman, I mean Russian Empress Catherine II. So desperate was uh, Grigory to uh, impress her when he learned she would be journeying to Crimea on the Dnieper River. He devised uh, a scheme to enhance his reputation before uh, the woman he wanted to impress. Uh, the region he, uh, that he governed had been decimated by war and the major task that was given to uh, the governor uh, was to rebuild what had been torn down, a typical uh, thing that a government would, would do after a war. So he arranged for these portable structures uh, to be built and erected along the other places too, but especially along the river, giving the appearance of villages and, and thriving communities. It's like a Hollywood stage set. Uh, it looked like something real on the outside, but behind it was nothing. Uh, so these buildings were designed to be put in place and then disassembled in order to be erected again uh, further down the river. And as soon as the barge carrying the empress and her retinue approached the village, uh, Potemkin and his officials uh, dressed up as peasants uh, would populate this village. And, 
Then after the barge uh, passed on, they would quickly remove the entire facade, carry it down the river to the next possible spot. So, as I said, it was a charade, uh, just like the charade the Pharisees maintained. If it had not been such a serious conceit, the Lord would have probably found it somewhat comical. In fact, I don't mind thinking that he did find it uh, pitiful and, and comical. Uh, but as it was, he simply informed them, God knows your hearts. He knows your hearts. He sees right through you. We should ask ourselves, you know, the teacher, when he's preparing, he sees these things and he asks himself. But we should ask ourselves, uh, what are the masks we wear? Uh, the facades we erect to avoid the spotlight of the Word of God revealing our blemishes, our sins, and our hidden frailties. And all in order to attract the esteem of some group, uh, to att attract the esteem of the world, to attract uh, the esteem of one's colleagues or the people uh, in, in your community. Just this year, there was a prominent man in a community near here who was unveiled as a dishonest man who engaged in thievery. He was, cons <laughs> was with a group of friends uh, for lunch this week and the subject came up and Someone was talking about what this man had done, and my good friend interrupted. He's a thief, okay? He's a thief. He, the, the, he was considered a, a pillar of his church and of his peers, and was entrusted with handler, handling ministry funds and the investments of friends and associates, people like you and, and me. But it turned out he was running a Ponzi scheme and he was spending their money on his own interests, on private clubs and travel while uh, continuing to build over here the business up with other people's new clients' money. I say this with real sadness. That we have friends who know this family and are grieving. They love them. They're standing with them in order to bring, try to bring about something good from it after he served his sentence. He's learning, uh, hopefully. Uh, the esteem of the world is nothing compared with God's esteem. How contrary are the things the world prizes to what God prizes. Nowhere has that been illustrated better than in the life of David in 1 Samuel 16 as Mike has guided us uh, through it. Uh, God sent this wasn't that long ago we studied it, but God sent the prophet Samuel to the home of Jesse uh, in order to select a new king out from Jesse's sons. And, of course, you remember uh, the story when they all came in. Samuel looked at Eliab, the firstborn, and he thought to myself, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Uh, Eliab must have been cut out of stone. I mean... Uh, he had to have been the most impressive looking uh, man and he hired a personal trainer, you know, to get him cut and uh, so that he could, uh, somebody told me the other day they'd seen people in the gym looking in the mirror at themselves. Uh, that happens, doesn't it? Go to a different gym than, than that one. But uh, he had a uh, a square jaw and a thick head of, of hair, and he held himself as if he knew it. I'm imagining this, of course, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't think that way. Don't think that way. Don't look at his appearance or his height. I've rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, what the empress might have seen when she sailed past those Potemkin villages, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then you remember they marched all of Jesse's other sons uh, before Samuel, but the Lord had chosen none of them. He had reserved the young shepherd who had not even been called into the parade. 
to be his chosen king. God's ways are not our ways. I would call that a major theme of the Bible. We manufacture religious artifices that are meant to impress a worldly audience or somehow earn God's favor, just as the ancient Israelites undertook with their sacrifices and their sacred assemblies. And God says, I hate them. I hate them. They're worthless. And that's the Lord's conclusion here in regard to the Pharisees seeking to justify themselves. See it there? That which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. It's not harmless. It reeks. At verse 16, it may at first glance appear as a bit of change of topic. I'm always interested, you've heard me say it a lot, about the flow of the passage. Okay, uh, where have we been? Where are we going? Uh, but So this may appear like he's changing the topic, but the mention of the law and the prophets in verse 16, uh, the phrase stands as the equivalent of the entire corpus of the Scripture, was meant to bring to fore the main boast upon which the Pharisees delusively hung their hat. Uh, They mishandled the law, as we all know, but they themselves insisted that they were uh, its arbiters, keepers, and, and defenders. The verb in that first line of verse 16 is not stated explicitly. That's why it's in italics probably in your Bibles. Uh, But most modern translations, noting the parallel phrase in the verse about the gospel of the kingdom of God being preached, provide a verbal clause like were proclaimed or were enforced. And hence my New American Standard translation, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached. So plainly, the Lord sees two periods of time during which God has communicated his grace in manifold ways to those who would hear him. And now a transition has recently taken place from one to the other. John the Baptist uh, was to some degree the last representative of the prophets of the Old Testament time period. But he also served as a transition figure to the New Testament era of fulfillment. So that his ministry, we may say, uh, bridged the two as he served to prepare the way for the promised king. It was because of that unique position he held in his defining role as the forerunner to the Messiah, Jesus would call him in Matthew 11, verse 11, the greatest of those born of women. Well, we encountered this phrase earlier in our study of Luke, the gospel of the kingdom of God, worded slightly differently and coming from the mouth of our Lord himself. It was in verse 43 of chapter 4. Jesus insisted then that it was the primary reason he had been sent. He said, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. The actual word uh, gospel is hidden in that uh, translation in chapter 4, verse 43. Uh, but the word translated preach is evangelizo, evangelizo, evangelism, which literally means to preach the good news or to preach the gospel. Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom by means of a call to repentance and faith in himself as the Savior who had come. It was the good news of the reign of God come to earth in the person of his king. It was through repentance and faith in him that an individual could enter into that kingdom in the here and now and with the certainty that he would become ipso facto a citizen of the kingdom that was to come. But the Pharisees, who again staked their reputation on their special relationship to the law and its demands, were missing 
the fulfillment of the scriptures, which Jesus represented and imbued, uh, they had pointed to him and he had come to fulfill all they set forth about him. But the Jewish leaders were blinded from the truth. The Lord then places <clears throat> the obstinacy in con their obstinacy in contrast to others in the last clause in language somewhat difficult to interpret. The kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. That phrase has attracted a variety of interpretations, especially when put side by side with a similar observation the Lord made in Matthew 11, verse 12. So this is what he said there. There Jesus stated, from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. John's ministry, his baptism, did attract what could be considered as violent responses, both favorable and unfavorable. In the end, uh, though it was the violence of men that brought him personally down to a beheading, the response to him broadly, to John, remember, as we read of him in the Gospels, was what A.T. Robertson described as a violent and impetuous thronging to gather around Jesus and his disciples. For our purposes, I think it best to follow our intuition and see his statement as one similar to others uh, Jesus made. Men and women should make every effort to enter into the kingdom. They should make every effort to enter into the kingdom. Or as one of the commentators put it, the kingdom presses ahead relentlessly and only the relentless press their way into it. Taken this way, it compares with what we've already seen in our study back in chapter 13. I hope you'll remember it. Verse 24 of chapter 13, where the Lord exhort, exhorted his followers to strive, strive to enter through the narrow Door, And then he went on to describe the weeping and gnashing of teeth that will afflict those left outside the door, knocking and, and begging when sadly it will be too late. If that interpretation sounds like a form of works salvation, then we must repeat what we said at the time we studied the chapter 13 passage. There is the, the human side obviously, to our experience of salvation from the gracious hand of God. We are called to repent, and we are called to believe in Christ's atoning work on the cross, and it's no false invitation at all. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father uh, but through me. In other words, come. Come through me. I'm the only way. And Paul, uh, writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, passionately uh, pleaded, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Do it. And then he gave the basis for his plea. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But it was this corresponding idea that Paul, the apostle of grace, had in mind when he wrote to the Philippian believers in Philippians 2 verse 12 to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. The fear and the trembling he references reflected the immense importance of the striving for salvation the apostle wanted to impress upon them. But the logical sense of it came immediately following that, as you know, that they would be able to work out their salvation only because it was God who is at work within them, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The general call is issued uh, to all. Strive, come, believe. God graciously extends it and encourages his own to broadly issue it, issue it themselves themselves. 
but the individual call, uh, the one that is empowered by God and is effectual, is the invisible one, the one we don't see, uh, the one that you felt uh, when you became a believer, when you, uh, in your will, said, I believe. I'm banking my eternal soul and its security on what Jesus Christ did for me. That's the invisible call. There was no sound. There was, there, there was, there, there was no uh, uh, big to-do. It happened in your heart. It's the call that transforms the impossible into the inevitable. It's what our Lord, what led our Lord in John chapter 6 to insist that uh, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Their, their striving will by divine power prove effectual, and they will enter the narrow door. So on the one hand, you have the divine sovereignty enabling our entrance into the kingdom. Here in verse 16 is the role of human responsibility. <clears throat> And now with verse uh, 17, uh, we find the Lord uh, heading off any mistaken inferences his listeners might make that perhaps the law then was completely irrelevant, saying, but it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one, one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Now, you probably recall that the Lord said a very similar thing in his sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, from a slightly different angle. Uh, the there, he said, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now that verse is the one uh, translated in the authorized version as one jot or tittle. Uh, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Uh, the Lord's reference there in Matthew chapter 5 was to the smallest uh, Hebrew letter, the yod, which is, looks like an elevated comma, tiny comma, uh, and, and to the little projections on some Hebrew letters that distinguish one from another. For example, uh, the Hebrew letter uh, bait, which is equivalent, if not equivalent, uh, uh, correlates to our English B. The, the Hebrew letter bait has a little stem at the base, just a little projection at the base, whereas the, the K sounding, kaf, uh, Hebrew letter, looks just like a bait, except it doesn't have that little uh, stem at the bottom. So. If it's got the stem, it's a bait. If it doesn't, it's a cough. So that's what he's re referencing here. Uh, but his point uh, was that the law would be fulfilled down to the tiniest uh, particular. And what that means practically for us today is first the infallibility of the original Hebrew text, which form uh, the Old Testament. Nothing can be added nor taken away from the scriptures. They all compose, comprise uh, the Word of God. Now, when the New Testament authors think New Testament now, assert that the law has been uh, set aside, uh, a phrase that the author of Hebrews used, or as Paul said, abolished, that the law has been set aside or that it's been abolished, or described in many other such ways in the New Testament, what they're saying is that the ceremonial prescriptions found in the law and applied to Israel as a nation were all now completely fulfilled in Christ. The shadows had become reality, and believers were no longer responsible to observe the various feasts and sacrifices that in reality had been put in place for the purpose of pointing to the one who would come as their savior and for whom these practices had been instituted in the first place. 
You search the scriptures, Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 39, because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you're unwilling to come so that you may have life. Don Carson labeled those verses the hermeneutical key to the Old Testament. You search the scriptures, but they speak about me, Jesus said. But all of the Old Testament still has great value and application today. Uh, they give moral guidance, uh, surely, and, and deeper insight into the attributes of God and the wonder of his excellencies. But they are also instructive in understanding in a more deeper way the person and work of Christ. We would have, we would be much less blessed with out Psalm 22, uh, with, without the, the suffering servant song of Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. They, these are instructive to us in understanding uh, the person and work of Christ. There is wisdom in them. Uh, we just spent, Mike, if you're listening, how long on, on those Proverbs? There's great wisdom in them, uh, useful for every believer in Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus, who is wisdom personified. Jesus did not invalidate the law so much as he fulfilled it. Now, the passage ends <clears throat> with a seemingly sudden and even out of context remark by the Lord about divorce. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another, commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. Except it's not out of context. Uh, the Lord's aim was to give a contrast, an example of the abiding character of the law over against the contemporary abuse of the law by the Pharisees. They were contorting it to suit their own predilections. The statement here in verse 18 is essentially the same uh, as that found in the Sermon on the Mount. Again, here we have two verses in five, both of which are also found in some form or fashion in the Sermon on the Mount. But in Matthew 5, verse 32, much the same thing is, is found there. With this difference, uh, Matthew's version states that a man who divorces his wife causes her to commit adultery when she remarries, as circumstances in that time and society would have pr probably forced her to do. She had to remarry. While Luke's version makes the man, not the woman, guilty of adultery at remarriage. Jewish law regarding divorce and remarriage is outlined in Deuteronomy 24, uh, verses 1 through 4. It allowed for only one legitimate uh, reason for a man to divorce his wife, the discovery of some, quote, indecency in her, which was to say evidence of immorality. Uh, the man was allowed to give the woman a certificate of divorce, and she was then free to go from there and remarry. But even then, uh, divorce was provided only as a permission and not a command. God hates divorce. Uh, that's Malachi 2.16, and the scriptures as a whole consistently discourage uh, divorce, encourage divorce of fidelity and uh, maintaining the union between a man and a wife. The Matthew 532 citation <clears throat> includes the exception clause regarding unchastity in the woman, while our verse here omits it. Why? Uh, probably because Jesus was not at that moment intending to exhaust the subject, but rather shed light on the Pharisees' abuse of the procedure. Some of you are aware of the rabbinic uh, background uh, concerning divorce during these years. Opinion on it amongst the rabbis was divided uh, with some of the more respected uh, rabbis like Shammai holding to 
a conservative view, close to the actual scriptures. But then there was uh, Hillel, who took a more liberal view. Hillel allowed divorce for offenses as slight as, as, as burning the toast at breakfast. That's not exactly what he said, but that was the gist of it. Uh, you spoiled the male woman. Later, Akiba came along. See, I just skipped forward there. Later, Akiba came along and taught that a man could divorce his wife if he saw a, another woman he thought was more attractive uh, to him. The point is the Jewish leadership, the Pharisees, uh, they were making a mockery of the law. A divorce was not its intention, only an, al an allowance in extreme cases, and as Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 5, because of your hardness of heart. It's hardness of heart that leads to divorce. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, many years later, the Apostle Paul would add to the uh, acceptable reasons for divorce in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, instances of abandonment, abandonment and the like. But his overriding position on divorce and remarriage was built upon the truth of the Lord's observations made to the Pharisees, heaven and earth would pass away before the law's provisions failed. Here's the issue at heart. The Pharisees were more interested and concerned with self, with self-interest. That's what led to their loose liberal interpretations of the Mosaic law regarding divorce. What served their base desires was what they were concerned with, not pleasing God, not serving him. We're often guilty of that ourselves. Instead of conforming our conduct to align with scripture, we manipulate scripture to justify our conduct. Yet God is the final arbiter. His word stands. God reigns, and it is the privilege of those who belong to him to fall on our knees and acknowledge his sovereignty and rule over us. Are you serving him? Or are you only giving the appearance of it? to project an image that reflects more what you want people to think than what pleases him. If you are, he's on to you. If I am, he's on to me, like he was on the Pharisees. It's not too late to own up. He welcomes us with open arms, those who would say, Lord, I've been living a lie. I want to live the truth before you. I want to live my life, an open book before you, not before the people at the office, not before the people at the school, not before the people in the neighborhood, not before the people in church. I want to live my life uh, before you and serve you. Father, we pray that, uh, well, we're thankful that there are so many here who have that attitude and, and are living their lives uh, openly before you uh, to an audience of one, as we often say. And we ask, Lord, that uh, you might instill in us a greater uh, appreciation uh, for uh, what you've done for us, uh, for the fulfillment of the law that you accomplished in sending your son to die for our sins so that with grateful hearts, uh, we might seek to serve him and uh, uh, model our behavior according to his word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.